What is going on? All right, so no matter where you are, as always, I hope you're having an amazing day, evening, night, whatever that is. Hope you're having an amazing time. All right, so you all should know by now, my name is Dr. Jason Dinsmore, AKA the Oakham Whisperer, and I wanna help you discover your inner Oakham Rockstar. Now, as always, what are we gonna be talking about today? So what I'm gonna try to do is consciously slow down and speak slower, because I know I talk fast, I talk fast not because I get excited about organic chemistry, but I get excited thinking about all of you crushing your class and ultimately getting to do exactly what you want to do every single day, no matter what that is. It's going to be different for a lot of you, but whatever that is, that's what I get excited about is you realizing that this class is not going to stand in the way of that. So I'm going to consciously work on slowing it down. It's very difficult. All right. So with that, what are we going to be talking about today? So here we're going to be talking about enantiomers and diastereomers. We've done essentially, I think already, two, two um, stereochemistry lectures. One was kind of small, the second one was a little longer. This one we're going to be doing enantiomers and diastereomers, and then next time we're going to be doing Newman projections. But specifically in here, what we're going to be doing is, once again, we need to make sure that we understand chiral carbons. We're going to focus on the dashes and wedges because that's going to help us figure out this difference between enantiomers and diastereomers. And then we want to learn how to draw all the possible structures, all the stereoisomers. All right, so let's start with this molecule here. Now, the one thing that I want to point out is that if your professor ever draws a structure with a dash and a wedge, you still want to make sure that that is a chiral carbon because you can draw dashes and wedges on carbons that are not chiral, meaning the fact that I'm just going to kind of throw something in here real quick. I want you to think about instead of that wedge BR, if that was a wedge CH3, you can think about this, that would not be a chiral center because we would have two methyls, right? We would have a methyl where the BR is and we'd have a methyl on the left-hand side. So I just want to point that out that just make sure you don't get tricked. Check to make sure every single dash and wedge you see is a chiral center. Now in this case, I want you to double check the fact that this indeed is a chiral center, but I'm going to do this with you, okay? So if we look at this, we can see that we have a bromine. We have a methyl, which is on the left, that's two. We have this carbon chain, which is three on the right. And then remember, we don't write it, but we've got a dash H, so that's going to be four. So this indeed is going to be a chiral center. Now what we want to be able to do is start with one chiral center or stereogenic center or stereocenter. Those are all the same terms. We want to figure out what we want to start with is what is the enantiomer, okay? But before we get there, I'm pretty sure some of you might be asking like, what is an enantiomer and what is a diastereomer? I think it's easiest to start with the enantiomer and kind of understand how to draw enantiomers because then once you get that, it's easy to find the diastereomers, okay? So let's look at this molecule right here. Now what I want you to do is I want us to draw and I want you to draw the enantiomer of that. So if you're familiar with this, what I want you to do right now is go ahead and draw the enantiomer of that, however you want to do that, okay? So go ahead and take the time to do that. You can go ahead, just draw it on your own, um, on an electronic device, a mobile device, on a piece of paper, but go ahead and do that, okay? Now, hopefully you pause it, you did that. Now, what I want you to do is when I want you to start drawing structures, whether it's all the stereoisomers or it's an enantiomer or it's diastereomer, the first thing that I want you doing is I want you to redraw the carbon structure. And what's great about this is there's nothing to memorize, right? This is an easy, practical, step-by-step -step process. So what I'm going to show you here is I'm going to show you what I call the quick version of drawing the enantiomer, and then I'm going to show you why we did this, okay? So here, what I want you to do is just draw the carbon framework. If it's acyclical, draw a train, chain, train, chain. If it's cyclical, draw this whatever ring it is, okay? But I want you to draw the carbon chains by themselves. What's great about that is you don't have to memorize anything, and it's right there. Now, to draw the enantiomer, what you do is, it doesn't matter if you have one chiral center, two chiral centers, a bazillion chiral centers, what you do is you take every single one of those chiral centers and you flip it to the other one. Meaning the fact that in this case we have a wedge, so we want to draw a dash. And in this case, it's going to be a dash bromine. So you take every center and you quote unquote flip it to the other one. So right here, what we have is these are enantiomers. With one chiral center, the only option that you have is an enantiomer, okay? So those are going to be that. Now, you've probably heard the fancy term for enantiomers, right? That they are non-superimposable mirror images, right? Most of us are not going to use that word on a daily basis, right, when we're, when we're going through our lives. So what does that mean? Mirror image part is easy, right? That would be like my hands, for example. If you looked at my hands, we can clearly see if I drew a line right here. They're clearly mirror images, right, or the best that they can be. Their mirror images mean they reflect each other. Non-superimposable means that I cannot take them and put them on top of each other the exact same way. Although they look the same, they are mirror images. You can't put them on top of each other so they essentially go exactly perfectly on top of each other. So non-superimposable mirror images, they're mirror images, and you can't superimpose them on top of each other, all right? Now, if we look at this, what I want to show you is that these are indeed uh, mirror images. Because you might be saying, well, Jay, I look at these, I see they're non-superimposable because 
One of them is a wedge and one of them is a dash, but I don't see the mirror image. Like, where is that? And the reason is because I haven't drawn them in that form. So what I want to do here is I'm going to go ahead and take this structure on the left and I'm going to number the carbons one and two. So two is going to be our bromine. This is just something I just decided to do to give us kind of, I number molecules and I want you to all number molecules because it gives you kind of a placeholder to know where you are. Now what we're going to do is we're going to take that molecule, it's going to be hard, and we're going to rotate it 180 degrees horizontal, okay? And what we want to remember is that when we rotate molecules horizontal or vertical, the dash now becomes a wedge. So we're going to take this. I'm not going to take the bromine off and pluck it here in a minute. I'm going to rotate it 180 degrees. Watch this. When I rotate it, now it looks like that. So I want to point out I did not pluck the bromine off and put it somewhere else. I rotated that 180 degrees, and we can see that I've kept my numbers the same, that it's still on what we labeled carbon 2. The reason it looks like this is because now we're looking at it from the other perspective, the other side. That's why every single center goes from dash to wedge or wedge to dash when you rotate it. Not because you've, you've taken the, the atom off or the carbon off or whatever it is. It's because you're looking at it from the other side. Now I think you'd agree it's very easy to see that these are mirror images in the fact that they mirror each other here. And I think it's easy to see that if you took one of these and like put it on top of the other one, they clearly are not superimposable. You cannot superimpose them. So you can see here they are non-superimposable mirror images. So that's why, that's the way that we would draw them to look at that, okay? But what I want you thinking about now that that should make sense is I want you to see the quick version where essentially we take the chiral center and we flip it to the other one and that's going to give us the enantiomers, okay? So now that we understand why, use the quick version. And the reason I wanna show you this is because I want you to understand why and how we're doing things here on these lectures as well as in your class and work out all the kinks here like I say over and over and over again because when you get to the exam I don't want those problems to arise I want you to have it so dialed in that when you get to the exam it's a no-brainer you're gonna crush it and you can use all these simple tips because you know why okay you know why this is happening now let's go ahead and do this I want to take this molecule right here and let's slightly modify this okay so watch this this is what we're gonna do now what we're gonna do is we're gonna add another chiral center or stereogenic center or stereo center okay now we have two instead of one. You can go ahead and double check me the fact that these are actually chiral centers that I didn't just make this up and just throw dashes and wedges without them. They are indeed chiral centers, okay? Now a question that you will probably get or typically get that I've seen over the years I've been doing this is a professor will give you a structure and they will say draw the enantiomer um, or draw all the stereoisomers of this molecule, okay? And so in this case, what I want you to do before we get started is I want you to take this molecule and I want you to draw the enantiomer based off of what we just talked about, okay? All right, so go ahead and do that. You can go ahead and write that on your own. You can, if you've got like a stylus, you can write it on an electronic device, you can write it on a piece of paper, but I want you to go ahead and draw the enantiomer, okay? So first, we're just gonna draw the enantiomer, but we're gonna get to after this, like I just talked about, your professor may ask you to draw all the stereoisomers, but we'll talk about that in a minute, okay? So what would you think that the enantiomer of this is gonna be based off of what we just talked about, all right? So what's the first thing that I told you that I wanted you to do when you have to draw an enantiomer? I want you to draw your carbon structure again. Okay, just draw it. What's great about this is you don't have to memorize this part. It's literally in front of you. So what I also want you doing is using what's right in front of you, trying to minimize what you have to memorize so you can use what you see right in front of you, okay? So in this case, just redraw your carbon structure. And then we said for enantiomers, what do we do? We flip every single center. So if we start with wedges, we do dashes. If we start with dashes, we do wedges. If we start with a combination of wedges and dashes, we just flip them. So in this case, we're starting with both wedges. So we're gonna convert both of them to dashes. And that is how we draw the enantiomer. So the key here with enantiomers is you take whatever the structure that you're starting with, whatever the dashes or wedges are, flip all of them. All of them have to change, okay? Now what I also want to do is I want to walk you through here systematically again. I want to show you what the mirror image looks like, okay? So what we want to do is I'm going to number these again, one and two. I'm going to say carbon two is my bromine again. And then I'm going to flip it 180 degrees horizontal again. And remember when we flip it, all the dashes and wedges change, not because we're changing the atoms, but we're changing the way that we're looking at it. So watch this. If I rotate this like that, I'm going to go back one more time. Watch. I rotate it, and essentially now we can see that my bromine is going to be on the right side, and I haven't moved the bromine. I've just flipped the molecule, and now we can see both of them are going to be dashes because we're looking at it from the other side. And now, once again, we can clearly see that these are enantiomers, that these are mirror images, and they're non-superimposable. We cannot superimpose them on top of each other and they are clearly mirror images, okay? But the one that I want you thinking about on your exam is if your professor gives you a structure with dashes and wedges and says draw the enantiomer, I want you thinking about drawing your carbon chain or whatever it is, the, the cyclical system or the acyclical, and then look at your dashes and wedges and then change them into the opposites, okay? The other ones, because there's only two options, dash and wedge, right? All right, so now the question is gonna come now, what if we just change one center? So we had two chiral centers, what if we just change one? 
Now we've talked about enantiomers and probably the no-brainer logical conclusion is that it's probably gonna be a diastereomer, okay? But we're gonna walk through this whole process and I'm gonna show you, okay? So like I just said before, your professor may give you a structure and say draw all the possible stereoisomers, okay? Now what they're not going to do more than likely is give you one like a dash and a wedge like this. What they're going to give you are just straight lines. They're not gonna tell you essentially that what you start with the dash and the wedge is they want you to take this molecule identify all the chiral carbons, all the chiral centers, and then draw all the possible dashes and wedges that you can get out, okay? So does anybody right now, you can go ahead and comment below, does anybody know what formula we're gonna to use to figure out how many total stereoisomers we have there? And as you're go ahead and commenting, if you're pausing this or trying to figure it out, um, stereoisomers, to kind of clarify, are enantiomers and diastereomers. Stereoisomers is like this big general term, and then you get more specific under there, and there's enantiomers and diastereomers. So, there's a specific formula. Does anybody know that we're going to use to figure this out? So what it is, is it's called two to the N, okay? And if you plug this number in for N, which is the number of chiral carbons, it's gonna give you the total number of stereoisomers, okay? So N is the number of chiral centers. So in our case, we have two, so we're gonna plug two in. So two to the two equals four. So that means that we're gonna have a total of four stereoisomers, and those include enantiomers and diastereomers, okay? So what that's telling us is that we have to draw four molecules. Okay, four molecules is what we're gonna do. Now, what we wanna do is just like we did before, what's the first thing that we wanna do when we wanna start identifying enantiomers and diastereomers? What do we do? We didn't have to memorize it. Remember, we don't memorize it. It's on the page right now. What are we gonna do? We're gonna draw our carbon framework, but in this case, we're gonna draw four because we know that we have to have four compounds, okay? A mixture of stereoisomers, okay? So go ahead and draw your carbon chains down. Now, I want you to do this as well. So if you're just sitting here watching me do it, if you have some paper around you, I want you to get that paper and I want you to draw it, okay? If you have an electronic device or mobile device beside you, I want you to get a stylus and write this, okay? I need you working on this as well because the, the key is to actually have you take your hand and write this on a piece of paper so you start to build the muscle memory in order of doing this, okay? It's great to watch this, but ultimately I need you to do this as well, okay? So go ahead and first draw the four carbon structures. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna systematically go through this. Now I don't know, for all of you math wizards, you can go ahead and comment down below. This is either combinations or permutations. I don't know which one it is, but this is basically what we're gonna do. We're gonna find out all the different ways we can draw dashes and wedges on those two centers. So if you know if it's a combination or a permutation, go ahead and message me down below or comment down below or message me because I, I don't remember to be honest. So it'd be kind of cool to remember rather than just not knowing. So let's think about this logically here, okay? So we can think about this. What's the first thing we could start with? Well, let's just say, let's make both of them wedges, right? That's the easiest thing. So let's just start somewhere. Let's make both wedges, okay? That's gonna be one. Now let's think about this. Well, what could we do? So we did both wedges. What if we did both dashes? Okay, well, that makes sense, right? That's a, that's a thing we could do. So both dashes, both wedges, both dashes. What else could we do? Well, we've got both of these the same. Could we like have switched them, like have them opposite? Well, yeah, we could do one wedge and one dash, that would make sense. And then what if we said, okay, well we did wedge dash, what if we did dash wedge? And that's exactly what it is. So you can systematically go through here and go wedge wedge, dash dash, wedge dash, dash wedge. Now what I wanna tell you about what I just showed you right here, you can do this for any molecule that has two chiral centers. I don't care if the chiral centers are next door to each other like this, I don't care if they're 50 carbons away, 50 atoms away, you can do this. What you're gonna do is you're gonna draw your carbon framework. I don't care if it's cyclical, acyclical. I don't care how long it is, how short it is. If you have two chiral centers, no matter where they are, you are gonna do the same procedure. You're gonna draw your carbon framework four times and you're gonna go wedge, wedge, dash, dash, wedge, dash, dash, wedge. You're gonna do that every single time. It doesn't change, okay? Now, let's take a look at this. Now what we do is go ahead and fill in our atoms. So we've got Br and OH and now we filled everything in and now we have our four structures, okay? Now what we want to do is we want to systematically go in here and look at these four structures and figure out the relationship between all of them. We want to find out all the relationships, whether it's vertical or horizontal or diagonal. We want to figure out every single one, okay? So I'm going to go ahead and erase this molecule over here because we don't need that. And now let's take a look here. The first one that I want you to look for, the relationships that I want you to look for are what, which are the easiest, the ones we've been talking about the whole time. Enantiomers, I want you looking for enantiomers. And what are we looking for in enantiomers? We're looking for everything to change. So what I'm gonna do is I'm systematically just gonna start looking horizontal, okay? So let's look at the first group. If you look at this, what happened? So let's, let's take the molecule on the left. Relative to the molecule on the left, what has happened to the molecule on the right? And this is the question I want you asking every single time. Did everything change? In these molecules, did everything change? Yes, the bromine changed and the OH changed from dash to wedge. So those have to be enantiomers. 
Okay. The question I want you asking is, did everything change? Let's look at the bottom. I'm asking you again, did everything change? Did every single dash go to wedge and every single wedge go to dash? Yes, it did. So those are also enantiomers. Okay. That's see. So now we know what we're looking for. We're gonna do the same thing. Watch this. I want you to start on the left-hand side. Did everything change? The left column, whatever that is, box. Did everything change? Now I put the answer up there, but I still want you to look. Did everything change? No. The bromine, check. The bromine stayed the same. The OH changed. Since everything didn't change, it's a diastereomer. It's really that simple, I know. Let's go to the right-hand side. Did everything change? I'm going to ask you this over and over again today. Well, if we look at that, the, the OH changed again, but the bromine didn't. So those are diastereomers, okay? Let's look at the diagonals. Same thing. Did everything change? The OH stayed the same. The bromine changed. No, so everything didn't, everything didn't change. So those are diastereomers. If we look here, we can see that the bromine changed, but the OH didn't. So once again, those are diastereomers. So what you're looking for is, did everything change? Okay. So that's how we're going to go through this systematically. Now what I want to do is, just take some time. If, if, For example, if that didn't make sense, go ahead and pause it, rewind it, look at it again. But basically the question, as you can see, I know you probably know this because I said it so many times, did everything change? So I'm going to show you a different way of doing this. Rather than having four compounds and trying to find the relationship between all of them, let's have a single compound. Your professor may ask this. Here's a single compound and tell me the relationship to all these other ones. So let's go through and do this. Let's compare these two compounds. What do you think these are? Okay. I haven't said this yet, this word, but I'm pretty sure you can figure it out. Um, everything stayed the same, right? <laughs> so they're the same molecule. <laughs> so I didn't talk about that, but if you literally look at it and say, wait, I don't understand. What, is this a diastereomer, an enantiomer? What is this? It's the same molecule. It's the same molecule. Okay. Nothing changed. It's exactly the same molecule. So we don't have to do anything with that one. Now, what about these? The question I'm going to ask you between these two, did everything change? Did everything go from a dash to a wedge and a wedge to a dash? Yes. So between those two molecules, those are enantiomers. The relationship are enantiomers, okay? Or you can say the molecule on the right is an enantiomer. Okay, what about these? Did everything change? Okay, if we look at them, did everything change? It looks like to me the OH changed, but the bromine did not. So if everything doesn't change, it's a diastereomer. Everything has to change to be an enantiomer. I know you're probably getting tired of me saying that, but I want that to be so ingrained in your head that you just automatically can look at it and know, okay? Let's do the last one. Did everything change? If we look at this, we can see the OH stayed the same, but the BR changed, so everything didn't change, so that also is going to be a diastereomer, okay? That's literally how you can walk through. You can do this with two chiral centers, you can do this with three chiral centers, you can do this with four chiral centers. As you can see, when you use that formula two to the end, you get more and more structures, but you can still systematically go through here, whether it's a combination or permutation. I'm hoping that some of you are gonna comment below, let me know which one it is. But essentially, you can do the same kind of procedure, whether you have two, three, four chiral centers, okay? But the thing that I want you paying attention to is I want you thinking about the enantiomers. When you look at two structures, did they change? Or if you have to draw structures, you change every single center. All right? Pretty cool, right? And pretty simple. Now, as always, you can see this was a quick lecture, but as always, I love having all of you come on here. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day to watch this so I can help you crush your organic chemistry class. And until next time, I hope you all have a good one.